today in the post lunch session we have a first i would like to introduce dr neeraj gupta sir dr neeraj gupta sir is working in the department of chemistry and chemical sciences central university himachal pradesh he has obtained his phd degree in 2008 from punjab university chandigarh thereafter he has gained industrial exposure for 3 and 1/2 year year he has developed an anti cancer molecule and has a usa patent to his credit in the year 2010 he was awarded with prestigious fulbright nehru post doctoral fellowship for doing research in usa in the year 2011 He has joined academics in Shalini uh, Shalini University, Solon, in the year 2012. Afterwards, he has been awarded with two more prestigious awards. He was awarded with Department of Science and Technology as a Young Scientist Award in India in 2014. And simultaneously, he was awarded by postdoctoral award by Chinese Academy of Science. So this is a very prestigious award, top five ranked research organizations in the world. For the year 2014 to 17, he has worked like this. He continued his journey of academics in uh, Sholini University, Solon, up to his return to India, and then after he has joined Central University of Himachal Pradesh in January 2020. Recently, he has joined this Central University. He is working in the area of catalysis with exposure to carbon material. with a main focus on metal free catalysis biomass conversion electrochemical sensing and their applications in uh, synthetic chemis organic chemistry till now he has published more than 50 publications with high impact impact factor containing journals such as green chemistry renewable and sustainable energy reviews and catalysis catalysis science and technology He is still working on developing user-friendly devices to be used by common people for detecting diseases related with neurotransmitter deficiency or glucose deficiency. He has also developed processes for making new chemicals directly from plants that can replace the chemicals derived from petroleum. So, such an eminent scientist with us, Dr. Neeraj Gupta sir. I welcome Dr. Neeraj Gupta sir. for his talk on designing of nano carbon based catalyst for upgradation of biomass derived lignite into fine chemical products dr neeraj gupta sir thank you very much sir for the kind introduction and uh, i would be very happy to interact with the young minds today uh, before i really start uh, first of all i would like to say thank you for the organizing committee uh because you know uh, i'm always anxious to interact with the young minds uh, uh you will feel this when you will reach my stage that whatever you do sometimes you always feel that the things that you have learned in the in your uh, career journey it should be transmitted to young generation so that the ideas can keep on growing so i hope that whatever i have done in this specific area or whatever i'm going to discuss with you will uh, inspire you to do more research into this topic and uh, you attain something good for our country also so with this words these words i would welcome all of you to today's talk which is basically on designing of nano carbon based catalyst for upgradation of biomass derived lignin and glycerol into fine chemicals as the name suggests let me uh before i really start let me analyze my audience and also explain this title so how many of you are undergraduates here raise your hands undergrad doing bsc no one uh how many of you are doing post graduation okay very few how many of you are doing phd uh that's really good so i have uh, uh most of the people who are really into the research that's a good point and how many of you are chemist i think everyone or out of chemistry also anyone out of chemistry here sitting in the audience uh so can i know your field which area physics okay uh, all of you are also from physics or some other area botany botany 
you also okay so i'll try to collaborate few things also for botany and physics people i think that uh, people working in physics may know a lot of things about materials and for botany maybe you can understand something about the chemicals that we can obtain from plants because you are familiar with the structure of lignin and other composition the biochemical uh, biochemicals we can say so uh how can i uh okay this one <clears throat> okay so as the title suggests that i'm going to discuss uh, uh nano carbon based catalyst so uh, these are the carbon based materials that we are going to take chemicals from plants so i think all of you know that whenever we are deriving chemicals from plants the uh, formation of petrochemicals in one of the natural process that is that nature is taking so you know i think every one of you are familiar that how petrochemicals are uh, generated from the living stock i don't want to go into the details of that but now you know because the fossil fuels they are depleting quite fast so and we rely uh, on petroleum industry for generation of lot of chemicals so we need to speed this speed up this process how we can do that can we really i um, take the chemicals that we are getting from the petrochemicals directly from the plant we don't need we don't want to wait for billion years so that is the one thing on which lot of chemists they are focusing these days and uh, few of the things that uh, i will discuss will be based on that so when it comes to carbon materials i think most of the chemistry people they know what carbon materials are so we are using platinum on carbon since 1924 it's a very common catalyst i think all of you are familiar that we have activated carbon on activated carbon we put a metal and we use it for hydrogenation reaction so that is the initial use where the carbon materials they find application in chemistry and every chemist even the botany and other people they know because they have studied this basic reaction in their plus 1 plus 2 or uh, in graduation so when it comes to the new class of carbon materials then we focus our attention towards the new class which is a nano carbon material so when we talk about nano carbon materials we think about three types of material the first generation second generation and the third generation of the carbon material so the first generation of the carbon material is uh, uh the fullerenes graphene carbon nanotubes carbon nanohorns and nano diamonds so this is uh, the first generation in the second generation what we do that these pure uh, nano carbon materials where all the carbon atoms are present are replaced by some other atom for example if you replace graphene with nitrogen few of the nitrogen atom you create defect in graphene graphene is basically a single layer of uh, graphite sheet so graphite contain multiple layers so if you are able to uh, yeah that's oh okay okay so this one okay so whenever uh, this is the graphene sheet we can say that uh, this is uh, the single layer of uh, uh, graphite material so when uh, all these they contain carbon uh, atom and no other atom is present uh, uh, in these material so in the second generation what we are going to do that we take the pure carbon material for example i take a nitrogen atom and few of the carbon atoms they are replaced by nitrogen so what will happen few of the bonds they are broken we create defects it is not a perfect sheet now so by creating these defects the quality for Uh, of the material is improved especially for the chemical transformation so you can generate lot of catalyst and uh, the uh, application of this material in various fields so we have nitrogen and boron doped materials here i have shown graphene sheets or carbon nanotubes so similarly we have third generation so where you can take a mixture of these two for example this is a uh, fullerene which is grown over uh, nanotubes and similarly we have a graphene sheet here at the bottom and you can see uh, this is a carbon nanotube grown over it so we have a hybrid so this is one more class that we generally take so so generally how to make different carbon catalyst uh, ready for different chemical uh, uh, transformations so if we want to use the carbon material 
uh, this is the one which is ideal. If you see only carbon, nothing else is there. So this is the ideal carbon material. And whenever we do some catalytic conversion, the ideal materials, they have very low uh, reactivity for catalyzing some reactions. So how we can increase their reactivity? So what we can do is, these are the few strategies. What we can do is, as I tell you, one of the strategy, introduce defect by introducing some other atom, for example, nitrogen boron. What else you can do? You can introduce functional group. So what we can do that we can dope it. We can do surface functionalization. What does it mean? So for example, carboxylic group, COOH group. So you oxidize any carbon material and during the process of oxidization, uh, oxidation the functional group, for example, COOH, aldehyde or ketone or phenolic groups, they are generated on the surface of carbon. So that is surface functionalization. So when you are creating these groups on carbon, uh, they become more efficient in catalyzing some reactions. So similarly, when you create a defect, there are some edge defects in the perfect crystalline structure. And those defects, they can also catalyze the reaction. So these are the sites. What you can do, you can also add some metal onto them. So that metal, for example, platinum and carbon. So what you can do is that you can add some atom onto these uh, nanocarbon materials and increase their efficiency. So when it comes to the conversion of petrochemicals, then we, again, I say that petrochemical is the chemical thing that we obtain in million of years. So now we really aim to develop a process that we can do like quickly. The plant material is dead and you take the dead material directly to make chemicals. So that is biomass valorization basically. So what does it mean? That we really need to derive the chemicals directly from the plant without waiting for the natural process that is completed in million of years. So Taking useful chemicals out of the plant or animal biomass is called as biomass valorization. So we have different uh, uh, processes when it comes to sustainability or reusable energy. So what you can do, geothermal, wind power, solar power, hydropower, and one is biomass where you are taking this chemicals. So you have a glimpse in the previous talk that how you can use especially this hydropower, water splitting, hydrogen generation and all. So we are going to touch this green aspect only, where we will see that how we can take the chemicals out of these plant biomass resources. So when it comes to plant biomass, I think all of you know that what it is made up of, right? One is cellulose. We all know it's one of the major component in all the plants. The second one, along with cellulose, we have lignin. It is a very complex network of aromatic compounds. So we have aromatic compounds, we have carbohydrates, along with this we have oil, right? So one is edible oil and we also have non-edible oil, where that oil is not fit for consumption, but the composition is almost same because oil is made up of triglycerides. So from triglycerides, what you can take? Glycerol. Along with this, these are other things, for example, xylitol, sorbitol, other carboxylic acids. And there are other series of compounds that are not directly present in plant, but somehow are linked to the plants. For example, the furfural can be derived from cellulose. So it is regarded as biomass derived chemicals. Similarly, 5 hydroxymethyl furfural. Remember, these compounds, they are very valuable these days. So if you can make 5-HMF, if you can make furfural from plant, it is really very valuable work because you are linking the fine chemical industry with the biomass industry. And we know that even whole of the cellulose is not even consumed by animals, wood, which is wasted. We are not even going to use that wood for uh, generation of the furniture. So such type of material, when it is dead, the plant is no more, it can be used for making useful chemicals. So these are the chemicals that are derived from biomass. And now in this talk, I will be discussing few of the strategies where we can use lignin because I cannot touch each and every aspect of biomass conversion. 
So I'm going to discuss the two aspects where I'm going to discuss that how we can use lignin as a source of, for making aromatic compounds and also how we can use this glycerol which is derived from the plants for taking fine chemicals that can be derived from glycerol and how we can use it further. So now the first, the first one is metal free oxidation of glycerol by enriched carbon nanotubes. So you see the title here what we are going to do. We are going to oxidize the glycerol which is derived from the plants for making a chemical which is dihydroxyacetone. So we, we have not done anything just oxidize the central molecule. So it's, uh, see the selectivity you know you have three alcoholic molecules and here in this catalyst only the center one is oxidized the other two remain as it is. So this is the selectivity of this catalyst where we are able to attain with a catalyst which is metal free. So again the question arises why metal free? Why metal free is important? So we know that you know water pollution right and sustainability they are two aspects that really need to be addressed these days especially in developing countries. Developed countries somehow they have controlled but it is a very big challenge for developing countries because uh, you know a lot of metal is being leaked into water. Water pollution is a very very big problem. So if we can avoid the use of metals uh, while designing the chemical processes it is really great you know. You just stop using metals. You do a process and you give it to the industry which is not at all using metal. So where is the question of leaking of the metal into the environment? You are generating a clean waste, right? Without any metal. And even if it leaks into the environment, you are at the safer side. No metal is leaked into the environment and you don't need to struggle with the water purification, uh, doing those expensive uh, uh, RO process and all for making it fit for human consumption. So developing metal free processes are also required at current time so that we can really attain sustainability these days. So that's why we have emphasized to develop a process which is metal free and linked to the biomass conversion. So I'm going to discuss the details of this process with you. So first of all we make a catalyst uh, where uh, uh, we have taken a nitrogen precursor right an organic molecule and uh, with the help of CVD we make these carbon nanotubes. So how these look? These look like this cup shaped material you know if you see one cup another stocked on another cup another cup another cup something like that if you see. It's a cup and one more inverted cup. So we see that it is a tube because hollow from inside open at the end so it is uh, we designate it as a carbon nanotube and also the dimensions dimensions are uh, 10 to 50 nanometers so the, they are not very big also 10 to 20 most of them so they are carbon nanotubes not nanofibers or some other material so once we make you can see that these are very beautiful fibrous structure that we get once we make them we try to know that if nitrogen is there on their surface or not so how we know it the process of uh, the characterization of xps so for those who don't know what xps is XPS is a technique that tells us that what type of atoms are present on a material. So chemical composition of a material. So what type of atoms are there can be analyzed through XPS. So we do the XPS and we look for nitrogen. Uh, so different type of nitrogen they have different binding energy. So based on those binding energies what we did that we are able to identify that which type of nitrogen is present on the surface. So we identify pyridinic type, pyrolic type, quaternary nitrogen as well as NO on the surface of this material. So this uh, really shows that this is the tabular form. I don't want to go into the detail of that but uh, let me simplify it. From this analysis we really make sure that nitrogen is there on my carbon material right and I make sure that in which forms this carbon is present. So once we know this we quantify that how much carbon is there, how much oxygen is there and how much nitrogen is there. So if you see that NCNT 700, 700 is the temperature that we use for making this material. So at 700 degree centigrade uh, uh, the nitrogen content is maximum and then what we did that we perform our reaction. So when we perform the reaction 
we did the oxidation by using tertiary butyl hydroperoxide. So, it is a peroxide and this oxidation can generate glyceric acid if it is oxidized. It can make dihydroxyacetone if the central molecule is oxidized and if both are oxidized, it is hydroxypyruvic acid. So, these three materials, they can be formed in this oxidation process. I think the chemist, they know that if you oxidize glycerol, all three OH molecules, this is a very simple oxidation process that can generate these three types of molecules. And when we analyze the different products by uh, GC analysis, we uh, uh, come to know that this is the one which is being made in highest amount. If you see that this is NCNT because here uh, even the this amount is very high but the conversion is less. So, this material where we are able to get 36 percent again you see this is not a very high conversion but because we did this reaction for the first time this went for a very good publication because you know we demonstrated this process for the first time that to metal free. So, that was the beauty of the work that even though the conversion was low, it ended up in a very good journal for publication. So, uh, so, now the question was to explain that how this reaction is progressing. So, uh, I uh, know, I think most of you are familiar with computational chemistry where we are using the computer uh, to simulate different models. Uh, where we can calculate the activation energy barrier for the particular reaction. So, we take the help of this computer system to know that how our reaction is doing. So, the pathway that you are looking here is not uh, being shown after a lab study. We just take the study of computational chemistry to know this pathway. So, I am going to discuss few points about this pathway that how we uh, uh, discuss the selectivity of this molecule. So, if we see that we take this molecule where uh, four aromatic rings are shown because nitrogen is there and we know that it is something like a pyridinic nitrogen. So, we replace one nitrogen here and oxidize it also because oxygen was also present. So, we do oxidation at two points, one adjacent to this and a one, one here. So, the one which is adjacent to it, this is the cyclic pathway and where it is here, it is shown like this. So, when we uh, this, uh, did this study, we came to know that this pathway where the this site and this site, they are oxidated, somehow are giving us the good selectivity of the product. So, the adjacent site, the oxidation, the conclusion of this story was, that if you have a pure pyridinic nitrogen, it may not give you the selectivity. The selectivity can be attained only if the adjacent oxygen atom. So, here both of they are required, but here the second one is here. Uh, and so, when this type of structure is there, it was giving us more selectivity as compared to this pathway where the second oxygen is here. So, oxidized adjacent. CO group to the nitrogen atom were found to be very active for this oxidation process and we have identified these groups in our XPS study also. So, this we again the catalyst is good if you can reuse it. So, we were able to reuse our catalyst for 8 cycles where almost same catalytic activity was obtained. So, 36 percent conversion was there everyone everywhere. So, this catalyst was nitrogen containing CNT was found to be very good for oxidizing plant derived glycerol where it was able to selectively make dihydroxyacetone out of three possible products. So, the selectivity of this catalyst was also very good. So, it, it has a very good use in biomass industry. So, along with this now we targeted one more compound which is derived from plant biomass and that is lignin. So, this is the lignin structure and as I tell you that uh, this can be broken down all these chains if you see these fragments. So, if you are able to break these fragments, you will get different types of compounds. So, these compounds can all are aromatic if they are not hydrogenated from the ring. 
So if all are aromatic, you can get hydrocarbons such as toluene. You can get phenol and phenolic products where ether or other compound substituents are there. So all these are phenolic products, pure phenol or toluene. So these are the products. And if even the ring is hydrogenated, you can get cyclohexanol also as a product. But because I don't get any cyclohexanol or very less cyclohexanol, so I don't show it here in this reaction. So the reaction that we study here based on carbon-based material is the one which we call as hydrodeoxygenation. So we really need to understand before we really go into the details of this process. So what is hydrodeoxygenation? As the name suggests, you are using hydrogen deoxygen, oxygen removal. So you are using hydrogen for the removal of excess oxygen content present in lignin. So if we are using hydrogen for removing of excess oxygen content for the generation of different chemical compounds, this reaction is called as hydrodeoxygenation. So uh, again, when I talk about sustainability, I say that metal free materials are very good. But again, the second challenge is, can you do hydrogenation without metal? Anyone? All of you are research scholars. Anyone? It's better to interact. Uh, do you know that? Can you do hydrogenation without the use of metal? For example, platinum, palladium, nickel. Can you do without them? No, it is very challenging. So though these days we are working in this direction also, I'm not going to discuss. I have done one process where uh, we have achieved metal-free hydrogenation also, but that's not a part of this uh, discussion. So we are, I'm not going into that detail because doing a metal-free hydrogenation is really a very, very challenging task. So in order to do the initial work, what we do, we choose a metal which is ruthenium and also palladium. And what we do that we choose these metals and we deposit the nanoparticles of these metals onto the carbon surface and then we perform the hydrodeoxygenation reaction. So I'm going to discuss two such strategies in this work. So the first work where we have used palladium. So what we do that we take palladium and different carbon supports as I show you in the first slide. So we take uh, activated carbon, very old material that we are using from 1993 that all the chemists are using. Then we are using ultra dispersed diamonds or we also call them nano diamonds. It's a diamond structure and nanometer range. And then we have also used carbon nanotubes and uh, these are the oxidized one. These are pristine. Pristine means we don't use any oxidation process as received. Along with this, uh, uh, so we take these four materials and deposited the metal. So how to deposit the metal is another task. So metal ion is converted into metal. So how we can do that students? Show your participation. How you can convert a metal ion into a metal in a zero valence state, which is the process, very basic chemistry. Are you not understanding? I'm, uh, I'm not understandable. Yeah, it's a very simple reduction. You are doing reduction. So we can do reduction by molecular hydrogen or as well as some reducing agent, sodium borohydride. So generally the reduction with gas is preferred because it does not lead to any metal ion impurities which are deposited on the surface. So we are always safe that no other metal is in the catalyst. Only the one that we have added is present on its surface. So for example, we use palladium salt. So we were sure that only palladium is the active component. No other metal is there. Because if you put sodium borohydride, there is a competition between sodium and palladium. And people always question, that was the role of sodium. You have used sodium borohydride. Prove that. So it increases your, you know, a complexity of a reaction. So in order to keep the process simple, we use molecular hydrogen for the reduction process. And we just take a palladium salt, palladium nitrate or palladium chloride and a very little amount. We do, you, we do not need excess of it. For example, if you have 100 milligram of your carbon material, even 2 to 3 milligram of your salt is enough for doing the reaction. So see how much low amount of metal you require. So you absorb it, you make the catalyst, and then we study that what type of metal nanoparticles have been deposited on it. 
So once we know it, we characterize it with the uh, XRD also. And uh, here uh, we can get information, for example, that what type of sp2, sp3 carbons or palladium, the state of palladium, whether it is a palladium metal or oxidized palladium present on the surface. So we come to know that small amount of palladium oxide is also present. We haven't used it, but still it is there on the catalyst. So we again say, because we are heating it. And whenever you are heating it and you just uh, stop your reaction, sometimes uh, when you remove it into the air, small amount of air always get absorbed onto the surface. And somehow this is, uh, this leads to the formation of palladium oxide, which is unavoidable. So really getting no oxygen on your catalyst surface is also a very challenging task or you have to be patient. Because I was in initial years of my research when I do this and you know when sitting in the lab for maybe 24 hours is a very you know tiring task and you are oh my reaction is done it should be cool very fast and you remove it and then you know oh, but just by doing one mistake not waiting for one hour you get palladium oxide. So again I'll say if you are going into research be ready to spend a lot of hours into I'm not discouraging you know whenever you are going into research uh, the basic thing is that you should always be ready to spend maybe 10 hours, 12 hours or maybe uh, my longest reaction that I have performed is 40 hours. So how to perform that? You really have to plan a strategy that how you can continuously run a reaction for 40 hours. Maybe two people are required who can work even in the night. You just have to monitor it because sometimes things like explosion or fire may happen. So you need an assistant but sometimes you really have to do it if you really have to attain good results. So be ready. I'm not discouraging. But the thing is that you, once you are mentally ready, you don't feel the things very mentally tiring. Otherwise, you are like oh, after six to seven hours, you always feel mentally tired. Oh, I want to go out because we are in a habit of uh, college hours or university hours where the classes are done and we immediately rush to our home. So this type of a culture does not prevail in research or even industrial jobs. So uh, again, we study the surface composition. And here we try to know that uh, what is the chemical state of palladium. So there were two types of palladium, palladium ions and palladium metal. So we calculated the ratio of these two metals. Along with this, uh, uh, we also uh, studied different type of functional group. As I tell you that when oxygen is present on carbon, it is present as a carboxylic acid or ketonic group or alcoholic group, OH group. So we identify these type of groups by XPS spectroscopy. And every catalyst has a different combination of all these things. We continue the study. So where you where we use all these catalysts for hydro deoxygenation reaction. So these are the uh, content we tabulated. So I'm not going into the detail. You can just see that how much palladium is different on every metal palladium ion and palladium zero right here it is different uh, palladium 2 positive is also different so here are the functional group which is different on all catalyst surface so then we did the reaction so don't be scared to see this table you know you really have to spend let me tell you the story behind this table i'm uh, sharing my research experiences also so you can see the entry from 1 to 26 so it appears that you have done just 26 reactions Believe me, this is triplicate result, means three to four times we have taken a reading. It means almost 90 to 100 reactions. Every reaction is not fruitful, you know. Sometimes we just take that, how many times you are able to reproduce this. So when you are, for example, two readings, they matches. So that is the value we are going to report here. This is how you do, this is how you do work, right? And again, I tell you, if you see the time, Reaction time 8 hours, 19 hours. See? And so uh, this is uh, uh, 19. I think there was one more. Uh, I don't share here. One reading was also there for 24 hours, more than 24 hours. So what we do is that we perform, that we take the catalyst, we take the lignin, we put it in a reactor where you can purge the hydrogen, you heat it or you don't heat it at room temperature and you analyze the products that what are the products so before doing on the carbon material we just take organic molecule vanillyl alcohol 
So vanillyl alcohol is one aromatic compound where you have OH, OCH three groups attached to it. So that we really want to see because these are the functional group uh, in the lignin also. So we just want to do before lignin on some molecule, organic molecule, where such type of uh, reaction, which is very close to lignin, can be studied. So here we see that uh, the catalyst was able to convert this vanillyl alcohol to 2 methoxy to methyl phenol. So here only one methyl group was generated and phenolic group was not uh, released. So what we concluded that this catalyst was somehow converting CH2OH group into alkyl group, but not the phenolic group into benzene. So that was the one thing that we come to know from this study. So again, we have three materials, nanodiamond, carbon nanotube, activated carbon. So we were not sure that if support is playing some role in this work, we just find a correlation that whenever there is palladium content which is increasing, the HDO capacity is also increased, hydrodeoxygenation capacity. But no such correlation was observed for any of the functional group or the surface. For example, uh, what nanodiamond is doing or what the activated carbon is doing, we were unable to get any information from this work. Even though we were able to publish it in Journal of uh, Energy Chemistry with impact factor 10, but still this was the limitation that was there in our work and we were unable to explain it. So finally, what we did is that we try to explain the mechanism of this reaction. So this is another work that we have done. So I'm not going to into detail of this slide. Uh, so here, uh, this is our another work that we summarized in a review. Uh, and we were again fortunate enough to get a good review. This is a, a renewable and sustainable energy review with impact factor 17 currently. So when we did this, uh, we proposed two types of mechanism. One is ionic and one was free radical. So these are the two mechanisms that we propose. So this is our work that was published that I'm discussing with you. But this is some other work that we have. Uh, compiled in uh, our review. So this is not our work, but uh, from the literature, we have designed this scheme in our review that we have published. So most of the people, when they have done the uh, hydrodeoxygenation reaction, everyone is confused. Even today, we are confused. We don't know whether it is ion intermediate driven or some free radicals are involved in this reaction. So there is a confusion because, you know, the moment you know the mechanism, maybe you can better design a catalyst. That is the purpose. That why we really look into the mechanism. Because until unless you don't know the mechanism, it is really very hard to hit the exact catalytic site that can lead to this process. So here we say that if you have iron, so how those ions, for example, a metal, metal ion. So that metal ion can coordinate to these groups and these somehow can split. So when ion is coordinating with the ether bond, so will it promote homolytic or heterolytic cleavage? Students, guess zinc ion in two positive state. If it is coordinating with ether bond, will it promote homolytic or will it promote heterolytic cleavage? Any guess? Yes, because you know it is ion. So it will try to take both the electrons and probably promote the heterolytic cleavage. So, heterolytic cleavage will initiate the formation of ions and not the in, uh, free radical intermediate. So, this was the proposition that we proposed that if people are using some ions, because there are a lot of catalysts that uses ion, and that ion somehow promote the heterolytic cleavage and reaction is progressing through the ionic intermediate. Whereas, when you are using nanoparticles, metal in zero oxidation state, for example, nickel carbon, platinum carbon. So you, all of you must have studied the mechanism of hydrogenation. So what is involved in this reaction? Free radicals, it is proposed. Mostly they uh, homolytic or heterolytic, both the cleavages are proposed, but mostly it is free radical which is generated. So when you have a metal, so it is adsorbed, uh, hydrogen is adsorbed and this hydrogen then generate a free radical and then free radical interact with these molecules where this ether linkage is attacked by those free radicals 
and definitely a free radical will generate another free radical you know that chain initiation chain propagation and chain termination so the conclusion is a pr proposition i'll say we don't do any experiment here we do here what we do one experiment uh, we take a, a, a radical quencher so uh, i think you know what are radical quenchers students what are radical quenchers how to decrease the rate of a photochemical reaction photochemistry padhi hai na have you studied photochemistry how you do radical quenching for example you are adding a peroxide right so when you add a peroxide that react with the radical that itself is not reacting with any of the reactant so that is radical quenching so we add a radical quencher and we observe that hdo reaction the rate of the hdo reaction decreases very rapidly so what does it mean somehow radicals are involved in this reaction so this we have uh, proved but again we fail to show that uh, uh, it is 100% radical because there are it should be zero but we don't never get a 0% conversion even when we use the excess of the radical quencher so what does it mean that both the things are there because if metal ion is there and you are not able to remove that you are unable to stop that uh, ionic mechanism so uh, whatever work we have done again lead to the indication that both the mechanisms they are prevailing on the catalyst surface the radical uh, ionic mechanism as well as the free radical mechanism so after doing it on vanillene our next task was to study that can we do it on a lignin that we get from the plants and that was the next question so we take this task and then we isolated lignin from plants so we uh, take a plant which is uh, uh, pinus in the region because uh, uh, solan uh, area we have a lot of uh, pine trees there so that was the reason we take a pine because lot, lot of waste is generated in that area so we will be able to show by that process that the local waste which is generated in the region can be used for generating some chemicals and also corn corn cob so i think whole of the india everywhere you have this corn cob so we just take the corn cob and also uh, extracted lignin from this corn cob so we have these two lignin and one we purchased from the market just to be sure that what will be our result because we really want to be sure that there is no error in isolating the lignin from these two plant source as well as the one that is available in the market so we take three lignin and again started with the model molecule one more after vanillin we just also try this guacol and uh, this time we replace palladium with ruthenium and carbon nanotube we just focus on one carbon nanofiber we don't make lot of catalyst so what we did that again we characterize that what type of catalyst it is there are metal particles and these are the ruthenium metal is also present on it so we decide this is hr time analysis that show that what is the morphology and with this mapping elemental mapping which is different from for every element you know that which type of element is present on its surface so we were able to see this ruthenium it has carbon because it is mainly carbon material there is oxygen also if you see and also uh, we can see that uh, uh, ruthenium and this is a combined image so this is very few you can see here maybe it is not visible yeah here it is not visible it is very as i tell you it is 2 to 3% not very high amount so you really on this slide maybe you are not able to see those particles of ruthenium purple color but it is there on the surface again we did the xps to confirm that uh, if it is ruthenium in zero state or oxidized state so we found that both are present there along with this we also see that carbon different type of functional group are present through carbon as well as oxygen spectra we did the ir spectrum and xrd i am not going into the details but the main thing is that we make sure that uh, Uh, ruthenium is in the present uh, is present as ruthenium zero or oxidized are you o2 form so now coming to the test into the laboratory we again performed reactions we performed so this is the one that i have done in india the previous one i did in china so this is the one that i have performed in india uh, upon uh, in shulini university so here 
we again did lot of reactions multiple reactions and we were able to get conversion in 24 hour that two at 80 degree centigrade we don't we don't have the facility to take the temperature up to a higher range so otherwise conversion could have been better so maximum temperature we were able to attain was 80 degree centigrade and we performed that uh, for maximum 24 hour and even we tried in 40 hour but uh, not much difference there maybe the catalyst was saturated by that time so maximum conversion was 79% where toluene was 78% if you see the reaction uh, this is the reaction so you know see oh when the toluene is generated it means och3 methyl this oxygen is removed this oh is removed see here as a very very good thing is happening it is removing all the oxygen linked to it and making the hydrocarbon so we were very excited from this result and we see that what will happen on lignin so then we take commercial lignin and did the same thing with the lignin and we use gc mass gcms technique to identify these products we really struggled a lot to identify so what we identify i'm going to share uh, these results with you so we have phenol this is also phenolic intermediate with och3 same here one alkyl is also there and almost the same thing few alkyl chain molecules also now the question was how these molecules they are obtained because lignin i show you was aromatic so this we can understand that there are side chains linking the aromatic molecules so these side chains when they cleave may result in the formation of this type of molecules and how these are generated when the aromatic compounds they are opened up these can form these straight chain compounds so these are the different compounds and we calculated their yield so the maximum obtained was this phenolic compound which is almost 31 percent in commercial lignin so coming from commercial to one which is we isolated from the corn cob the lignin that we get maximum was this toluene right so it is almost 10 percent and others are very less and also almost the same thing this was something new that we get but others are more or less they are same so when we perform it with the pinus bath then again we get almost 12 percent of this toluene and other hydrocarbons and also the spray chain analogs so we are able to get almost different variety of chemical compounds from lignin that are hydrocarbons right heterocyclic compounds uh, phenolic compounds ethers and even straight chain alkanes from lignin which is very good so if you keep on doing this process what we are able to demonstrate that you can use the plant lignin directly to form phenolic as well as straight chain aliphatic compounds so this is one of the significant it means that you do not really need to go for petrochemicals directly use lignin use the catalyst design a catalyst and directly the only thing is on which we are working right now because it is a mixture so now we are working on a process where we can get individual component as a pure component so that they can be supplied further right now we have attained a stage we are a pool of such chemicals is generated so so this is the hplc graph if you see where we have shown that where the peak of these compounds they are obtained and compare their mass spectra so already discussed this in the uh, so this is the recyclability of the catalyst again we tested it up to six catalytic cycle and the question was still there was a question whether ionic or radical mechanism was prevailing so we did one more attempt okay let us try this time with some other models uh, computation study because uh, uh, studying it directly in the reaction is a very challenging task and you really need very sophisticated instrument for example in situ esr studies and uh, unfortunately we don't have access to such type of instruments in uh, at least in my place i'll not say india maybe 
they are there in uh, iits or isc but at least in my place i do not have access to so therefore that's why i again switch on to computational model let us see that what computer has to say for designing this process so we design a model carbon nanotube we oxidize it created these functional groups and we identified where the metal is located so this identify that whenever ruthenium is present in the zero valence state it sandwich itself it always moves away from the functional group and prefer to go above the layer somewhere in between the groups but it is not coordinated we can understand this also you know iron can form a coordinate bond but metal in the zero valence state will not prefer to do that is something like that so uh then we based on this we try to see that how the solvent will interact or uh, what is the activation energy barrier for different molecules so we started with the uh, the molecule guacol and we find that uh, it is adsorbing onto the carboxylic group and when it is uh, uh, present nearest to the metal center the metal center as usual cleaves the hydrogen and this hydrogen when cleaved uh, prefers to go in the radical form here because we uh, studied both that if it is heterolytic cleaved here what is the activation energy and when it is homolytic cleaved what is the activation energy and computer says that when it is homolytic uh, cleaved the computational energy uh, the activation energy is less so we propose that it is the radical which is preferred the most again but if the radical pathway will be blocked it will be forced to go for the heterolytic cleavage so here again we were unable to propose the just only one side of the catalyst again we say that both the mechanisms are probable though the radical mechanism has the higher end so if every facility is there the reaction will definitely move through the involvement of the radicals and where these radicals finally uh it will again be cleaved and this cleavage finally this step we really need to understand right now because uh we were able to get a toline with a very low activation energy but what type of intermediate is involved in this step is still not clear to us so right now we are working on this area that if it is really taking away the oxygen is it totally detached from this molecule or it is a concerted step we really need to propose it and this is a part of our future study we are just doing it right now and we will propose it in our next publication so with this i am going to conclude my talk so what we have done we have done a metal free oxidation of biomass derived glycerol that you can get from non edible oils and convert it into very useful chemicals and the chemical that we prepared here was dihydroxy acetone so when it comes to the mechanism of that reaction we say that pyridine nitrogen group in the carbon nanomaterial are responsible for that and they can show activity also when their adjacent carbon is oxidized in the form of co that was another so when it comes to hydro deoxygenation reaction we say that active metal component is really necessary so you cannot perform it without metal you need some metal that can cleave hydrogen for example ruthenium or palladium so we are trying to do it without metal um, you need very sophisticated techniques and maybe maybe uh, the young mind sitting over here can propose something to do hdo without metal for lignin believe me this is going to be very big boom in the industry if you can do that so with this uh, we say that we can we were able to link this process to the plant derived lignin that we really isolated from the area where we live and we demonstrate this process on two lignin which we isolate from pinus as well as from uh, corn cob and we were able to get a pool of various compounds that contain phenolic compounds aromatic hydrocarbons and even straight chain uh, uh alkane derivatives so still they have oxygen not the pure alkanes for example straight chain carboxylic acid esters were present in the pool so with this we uh, were able to show that we uh, the carbon materials they can be used for designing sustainable metal free catalysts for the biomass conversion 
as well as uh, for the lignin conversion uh, that too is sustainable but again uh, if we can make it metal free would be a great contribution to the chemical society in large so i'm really thankful to the organizers uh, committee members of mn college visnagar for inviting me for this uh, talk i'm really very happy to interact with uh, all the young minds over here and uh, along with this uh, i i'm really thankful to fulbright commission usa uh, that uh, introduces me into the field of biomass conversion because my project that i have written for fulbright fellowship was on biomass polarization that i get in 2011 and simultaneously carbon material i'm thankful to chinese academy of sciences because uh, uh, i write a project by collaborating these carbon materials to the biomass polarization that was awarded to me for three year research in chinese academy of sciences xinyang china and uh, professor dangcheng su who is no more in this world but uh, you know i learned a lot of things from him uh, about the carbon materials and uh, these are my collaborators who are still helping me for doing lot of work because uh, whenever i am stuck here in india and i say oh i am not getting anything so they come for my rescue okay i have computer i have good uh, computational thing so you send me your models and alberto always say he is my uh, post doc uh, um, fellow so we both were doing post doc with professor dangcheng su so he always come to my rescue oh i have lot of facilities in italy so you just send few of my materials i would be happy to test these otherwise uh, it's really very challenging to do this the biomass conversion uh, sitting in india where the facilities are almost at par with the mn college visnagar believe me may you maybe you must be feeling that i am in a central university but my university is at par with your college no difference uh, and then uh, these two universities that helped me to get a position when i return back to india the shuli university offered me a job immediately upon my return to india and now i am continuing my journey of research in central university of himachal pradesh so uh, these are the key publications uh, that i tell you one is uh, chemical engineering journal that we recently get uh, and then uh, this is advanced material technology then we have uh, sustainable renewable energy reviews also uh, material uh, chemistry today chemistry uh, and uh, i am very thankful to these uh, three generals that have highlighted uh, my research into their front page uh, so this is really a great honor for me uh, i hope you know you can feel that uh, how a scientist will feel if his work is highlighted on the research front page of the research journal so this is chem electrochem my biosensor work advanced material technology wiley germany they highlighted one of my uh, biosensor work recently this is very recent paper and chemical engineering journal where we get a cover page article this year uh, and uh, along with this uh, you are not alone to do all these things your students they always come to your rescue so when i come back to india i am fortunate enough to have a good team so from 2017 uh, 16 onward till now uh, my seventh phd students will be out next year so six they have completed so that's the list now these are my current phd students in central university of himachal pradesh and this was my team in uh, shulini university that have uh, done very good work on biomass conversion especially ashima vinith they have really done very good work on biomass conversion so with this i thank you all for being the patient listener thank you very much and i would welcome all the questions from you sir Yeah, actually, in the post session, we are learning very great. So uh, I am giving just five minutes for any questions if you have. Yeah. Say about nanocatalysts, but how does it actually look? If in a nanoscale, so how do you incorporate it into the actual? Yeah, that that's what I uh, tell. You know. Uh, mm, uh, when you are uh, saying that a carbon material, it looks same. Uh, you are unable to distinguish if it is carbon if it is nano tube or if it is a nano diamond because everything is black a black powder so analysis as i uh, tell discuss uh, tem tem images because they really can show you uh, i show you the images if it look like a tube or it is a diamond 
So you really have to go for microscopy along with XPS. So these two analyses can really tell you that if really that site is there, without those analyses, no, you cannot tell it. So you really have to go into the details. For example, if you're an organic chemist, you know, we cannot say that this is a compound without doing the NMR and IR analysis. So similarly, you cannot tell that if it is a nanomaterial without doing 10 and XPS. Okay. Uh, this one? Uh, then, uh, uh, this one. So, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, so these are not additive facts. Uh, it is related to particular million types in so the testing of the particular element. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, basically, uh, yeah, because it was a mixture and uh, we basically just try to identify, if that is lacking, I do agree, uh, because our focus was just to see that if it is a palladium oxide or palladium. So, we, we, we could do that. Yeah, next time we'll see that if we are going to do that, we can do that for media indices also. We'll take that suggestion. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. One question which is of my interest always uh, can this liquidity be changed with respect to temperature? Because when we it gets so many products, it's a linear change, aromatic, hydroaromatic. So if the temperature changes, do we have so liquidity? Uh, yeah, that is, that? that is, you know, this is one of the very recent work. You know, I just get a publication of the last work that we get uh, this month itself. So uh, that's really a nice uh, question and aspect that we really would like to probe. So the practical challenges that we are facing right now is the deficiency of a very good instrument. So as I tell you that I do not have an instrument that can go beyond 80 degrees centigrade. So I'm trying to get one good instrument from my university and uh, frankly speaking from two years my file is you know not moving at all. So if, if they give me that instrument I would be happy to do that you know. It is always uh, better to study it up to 250 degree centigrade because you know the moment you will uh, increase the temperature definitely why we have still the oxygen because we were unable to attain that temperature. The moment we will raise the temperature maybe 150 all the oxygen will start becoming less and less and the content of hydrocarbon will increase. You are you are very true but you know this is something a uh, limitation of the working facility that's it. We would, we would be happy to do that. I'll see uh, how we are able to attain that. And one small thing, is there any scope of microwave? Uh, yes, again, but uh, mm, microwave, the two things will be, uh, as I tell you that uh, it will be great if we can do it metal free. Because sometimes when we go for metal, I'm always afraid that uh, metals and microwave combinations, somehow the orientation and all those things, they are some some something problematic. So therefore, uh, it can be studied, you know, if you can use those metal nanoparticle in a microwave reactors. But again, you need some collaborator who has a very good microwave reactor to whom you can supply these materials and then we can analyze at what microwave uh, radiations can do. But that that's also a good idea that we can study. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, we hope that uh, uh, today is a very serious problem in the or Delhi. Parani of this Aliyara, which is creating new problem for Delhi. I think uh, with your research work and the team which are uh, going to approach in this direction, there is a work to realize other things or liquid will be converted into petrol chemicals within a few days. And we can resolve this problem too. If we not one, there is a structure yeah. to other things. Yeah. We need biorefineries. Yeah, I think. So we hope so. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. We just give it to Dr. Gupta, sir. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.